Hey Optimancers, Chris here. So why do optimizers often favor multi-class builds over single class builds? Because if you manage your selections carefully, so you're taking the right class with which, you're taking the right amounts of levels in each class, you're taking them in the right order, you can often end up with a sum that is greater than the total, so that a multi-class build of a certain level might become more powerful than a single class build of the same level. However, that's only if you are multi-classing carefully. If you multi-class haphazardly, it's very easy, in fact, it's maybe even probable that you'll end up with a character that is less powerful. And in some cases, you'll get builds that are absolutely a mess, uh, that are well behind the rest of the party. Today's video, I'm going to try to help you move from that situation to the point where you can make your own multi-class decisions without looking online for pre-made builds and make a decent optimized character using multi-classing and basically give you some guidelines to follow. Now, these are generalities, so we're not talking about advanced optimization here. We're talking about the basic tools you need to multi-class and be decent at it. And I will be following up this video with a second video where we are going class by class and talking about jump points. Now, what a jump point is, is the optimal levels to consider leaving a class and multi-classing into something else. Uh, so tune in for my next video where I will go class by class and discuss jump points for each of them. Today, what we'll be doing is generalities of multi-classing. So first, let's go over the basic rules of multi-classing. And if you are an experienced player, you might think you know all the rules on multi-classing. I bet you there might be one of them that you actually don't know. And I'm thinking of one rule specifically that I think a lot of people don't know because this one took me by surprise not all that long ago. Hi, if you like this kind of content and you'd be interested in supporting it, please find a link to my Patreon page in the video description. If you're already a patron, you already saw this video, early and without YouTube ads. In addition, depending on level support, you might be a member of my exclusive Discord community, or you might get an individual thank you in these videos, like I'm about to do right now. Pedro de Vaca, Prometeo NTG, Raman Goblin, Rohit, RVSP66, Ryesquai, Sajan Abraham, Sam S, Scott Dunnington, Scott Shields, Stephen Edmondson, TUM, Tazel, Tom Tom, Tristan Bello, Vu, Wesley Terpstra, Zachary Shapiro, Alex C, Hey Mr. Wonderful, Alexander Tinkov, Babrak, Blue Wolf, Brian Delgado, Brother Shadow, Burr, and Chuck the DM. Thank you all so much for your support. Let's get started. Now, multi-classing rules are technically optional. So if you're not sure whether your table uses them, check with your DM, though I think most tables use multi-classing rules. And the way it works is fairly simple. When your character gains a level, you can choose to multi-class. So let's say you made a rogue and you've reached fifth level, and now you decide you want to make it a multi-class character. So instead of becoming a sixth level rogue, you would become a fifth level rogue, first level something else. So let's say a fifth level rogue, first level sorcerer. Then you gain another level. So now you're a seventh level character and you decide you might want to multi-class again. So now you're a fifth level rogue, first level sorcerer, first level fighter. However, you can't just multi-class into any class you want to. You're going to need to meet the ability score prerequisites. Now, regardless of what the ability score is, the prerequisite is always a 13. You're going to need a 13 in the qualifying scores. And here they are. 10 of the classes require a single ability score, and fighters actually let you have either a 13 strength or dexterity. So technically speaking, they are the easiest to qualify for. Monks, paladins, and rangers are the hardest, each requiring two ability scores of 13 or higher. The one ability score you never need to qualify for multi-classing is constitution. Intelligence is the next least likely to be needed with only two classes requiring it. Now, when you want to multi-class, you don't just need to satisfy the prerequisites of the class you want to multi-class into. You also have to satisfy the prerequisites of the class you want to multi-class out of. So if you are playing a dexterity-based paladin with an eight strength, you can do that, but you are not going to be able to multi-class at all, unless you somehow increase your strength to at least 13. 
and it can't be a temporary boost, so putting on Gauntlets of Ogre Power isn't going to help. But let's say you just gained a level, and you do meet the prerequisites of both the class you want to multiclass into, as well as the prerequisites of the class you're currently in. What happens next? Well, you gain a level in the new class, and to start with, when your hit points increase, you will not be using the class you used to be, you'll be using the class that you now are. So if you are a rogue and you multi-class into fighter, then for your new level, you'll be using the D10 or six additional hit points. The other thing to keep in mind is that you won't necessarily get all the stuff that a fighter one normally gets. A fighter or any other class gets starting proficiencies. And for the most part, you don't get them, but there are a few exceptions. First off, as far as saving throws goes, you're not going to get them. So whatever your saving throw proficiencies were, that's what they stay. However, when it comes to armor, weapons, skill, or tool proficiencies, you may get them depending on the class that you're multiclassing into. Here is the list. Now there's a lot of information here, so let me just give you the basics. If you want an additional skill proficiency, bards, rangers, and rogues will all give you one. But there is some nuance there. So let's say you're a first level rogue. You should have four skill proficiencies through your class. You want another proficiency, so you multi-class into Bard. Now your first level Rogue, first level Bard has five skill proficiencies from your class selections. But let's say it's the other way around. So you start with Bard. Well, in that case, you started with three skill proficiencies from class. Then you multi-class into Rogue, and now your first level Bard, first level Rogue has four skill proficiencies from your class selections. So you end up with one fewer skill proficiency, even though you still have one level in Bard, one level in Rogue. So it's not just the classes that you mix. The order in which you take them makes a difference. Secondly, no class gives you heavy armor proficiency by multi-classing into it. Now you can still maybe get heavy armor proficiency from a subclass feature. Like there's some cleric subclasses that give you heavy armor proficiency right at level one as a subclass feature. And there's artificer armorers, though that's a three level investment. So basically a fighter one, rogue one, will have a heavy armor proficiency because they started in fighter, but a rogue one fighter one won't. So here's another case where the order in which you take your classes makes a difference. And if you already have armor, weapon, or specific proficiency, then multi-classing into a class that provides those proficiencies doesn't give you anything extra. It's not one of those cases where you already had the tool proficiency, but then you multi-classed into rogue, so you get to pick something else. I mean, you can always ask your DM, but the rules themselves don't offer that option. Speaking of the order in which you take your classes in, I should probably talk about hit points, because normally you get the same amount of hit points from a class, regardless of which level you gain, except level one. Level one, you always get maximum hit points. That means the higher the hit die, the more benefit it is to start in that class. So if you're a rogue and you multi-class into barbarian, at level one, you'd have eight hit points from rogue, and at level two, you get seven more from barbarian. So that's 15 total, plus your constitution modifier and anything else that might affect your hit points. But if you go the other way around, so you started at barbarian, well, you would have 12 from first level, and then with rogue, you would get five from second level. So suddenly you have 17 plus any other modifiers. So there is some advantage to taking the class with the bigger hit die at level one. Here's a couple other multi-classing basics. So your proficiency bonus scales as normal, regardless of multi-classing. So every character is going to have a plus two proficiency bonus at level one. Then it becomes plus three at level five, regardless of their class mix. Then it becomes plus four at level nine, plus five at level 13, and plus six at level 17. However, ability score increases don't work like that they are treated as class features. So if you become third level in a class and then you multi-class into another class, you're not getting your ability score bonus. You have to wait till you reach the level in a class that provides an ability score bonus to get that ability score bonus. So you can be third level in one class, third level in another class, third level in another class, third level in another class, and you would have zero ability score increases. Now, for the most part, the way it works is you get the features of the class that you multiclassed into. So you were a barbarian and you multiclassed into rogue. Well, now you're going to get sneak attack and you're going to get expertise. But there are some exceptions. The first exception is channel divinity. So basically, if you multiclass two classes that have channel divinity, you get hosed. 
Uh, and this really only affects clerics and paladins. But clerics get one use of channel divinity at level one, and paladins get one use of channel divinity at level three. But if you have a multi-class, first level cleric, third level paladin, those abilities don't combine, so you still only get one use of channel divinity. Now you can use that one use to either access your cleric or your paladin channel divinity options, but you have half as many uses as you probably should have. And cleric and paladin don't mix well anyways because of the prerequisites. So it just doubly screws you if you want to be a cleric paladin, which is too bad because cleric and paladin actually conceptually kind of makes sense as a multi-class, but in terms of mechanics, you just get screwed over and over again, so it just doesn't work out well. Second, if you want a multi-class, two classes that have extra attack, you get hosed. Basically, extra attack, when you're talking about the classes that get it, it tends to be a premier feature of that class. It's a standout. However, if you multi-class into a class that also gets extra attack, you not only don't get it, you don't get anything to replace it. So you just basically get straight out hosed. So what you see with optimized builds is when you have a class that gets extra attack and then you multi-class into other classes that might eventually get extra attack, you tend not to see enough levels that they hit that level where they would have gotten extra attack but instead get nothing because that's just not optimal at all. So if you have a fighter that's level 5 and you multi-class into Barbarian, you're probably not taking 5 levels of Barbarian. You've probably taken 1 or 2 or 3 or something like that. Uh, and we will also see that these classes that get extra attack are more incentivized to multi-class into classes that don't provide extra attack so that you don't have that problem. And I should mention that the Warlock Thirsting Blade Invocation that allows you to attack twice with your Pact Weapon is lumped in here too, so it doesn't combine with extra attack either. Now if you are a Warlock, level 5, that took Thirsting Blade, and then you multi-class into Barbarian, and you take 5 levels and get extra attack, then what you would really want to do is go back to Warlock, because at least in that case, you could select a different invocation. But if you're two classes that get extra attack, there's nothing else you can select. You just lose out. Now the standard extra attack feature that we see on most classes and subclasses says that you can attack twice instead of once when you take the attack action on your turn. But there are two exceptions to that. The fighter, when they get to level 11 and technically level 20, and the blade singer each have a different form of extra attack. So fighter at level 11 allows you to attack three times when you take the attack action on your turn, while the blade singer allows you to attack twice, but it allows you to change one of those attacks into a cantrip. So if you get extra attack from multiple sources, but that extra attack is not the same, you cannot combine them, but what you can do is you can choose which one you use. So let's say you're a fighter 11, blade singer six, and now you have extra attack, two different sources, and also neither of them are the standard one, well then you get to choose. You can either attack three times or you could attack twice and replace one with a cantrip. What you can't do is attack three times and replace one with a cantrip. You have to choose one or the other. Next up, and here's the one, if you figure you know the multi-classing rules, I'm gonna test you here. If you multi-class two classes with unarmored defense, you're gonna get hosed. Now there's only two existing classes with unarmored defense, and that's Monk and Barbarian, and they don't multi-class well together anyways because, again, the prerequisites kind of make it difficult for those two to get together, but the designers wanted to make sure that if you got unarmored defense twice, you kind of got screwed. So just briefly, uh, the Monk unarmored defense feature basically allows you to add your wisdom on top of your regular modifiers when determining your armor class as long as you aren't wearing armor. While the Barbarian allows you to add your Constitution modifier to your armor class calculations as long as you aren't wearing armor, though that one does allow you to wear a shield. So here's where I'm going to ask the viewers who do know the multi-classing rules a little question. So I'm going to make it easy. This is true or false. So let's say you multi-class your Barbarian and your Monk. You cannot combine the unarmored defense from your Barbarian and your Monk classes. Instead, you must choose which one you're going to use, and that's the only one you benefit from. True or false? Did you say true? Then you're wrong. It's false. And I mean, pause the video right here, grab your player's handbook, and read for yourself. If you already have the unarmored defense feature, then you can't gain it from another class. This is uh, word for word what's written in the player's handbook. That means if you are a monk 
and you multi-class into Barbarian, not only can't you combine the two armored defense features, but according to this, you don't even get the Barbarian unarmored defense feature. So you can't even choose to use that one. Now, when it comes to multi-classing rules, the final thing to go over is multi-classing spellcasting classes. So here's how it works. Other than Warlock, the rules are fairly simple. So basically, you take your prepared spells or known spells as you normally would for every class that you are multi-class into. So let's say you're a Cleric 4, Wizard 4. You're going to prepare spells as a 4th level Cleric, and you will prepare spells as a 4th level Wizard, and those are your prepared spells. Normally, that means you will have more prepared spells than if you had gone 8 levels in either of them. However, you're limited to nothing higher than 2nd level spells. You're also going to select your cantrips separately for each class. So you're going to select your cantrips for wizard and your cantrips from cleric. So when you start multi-classing these classes that get cantrips, the cantrips start piling up really quickly. I mean, I've seen cases where you multi-class three classes with cantrips and you get to the point where you just don't know what cantrips to take anymore because the list is so long. Where you don't figure things out separately is the progression of your spell slots. Instead, you're going to use the chart. I'm going to put it up right here. This is a match for the spell slot progression chart for clerics, druids, wizards, sorcerers, and bards. So your 4th level wizard, 4th level cleric has spell slots from the 8th level entry on this list. That means that you're going to have spell slots that are a higher level than any of your spells. And what you can do is you can use them to upcast any of your existing spells. So you can use these slots for any of the spells from any of your classes. So if you want to use all these slots on your cleric spells and not cast your wizard spells at all, you can do that. If you are multi-classing Paladin, Ranger, or Artificer, you only add half the levels in your class when advancing on this chart. Paladins and Rangers round down if they have an odd level, while Artificers round up. This provides an advantage to Artificers multi-classing at those odd levels and a disadvantage to Rangers and Paladins. If you're multi-classing your Eldritch Knight or Arcane Trickster, you add one-third your levels rounded down. Warlocks are the exception. Their class levels do not combine with any other spellcasting class. They don't use this chart at all. Basically, work out your Warlock spells the same as you would if you were a single-class Warlock. However, the one thing you can do with a multi-class Warlock is you can cast any of your Warlock spells with your regular spell slots or you could cast the spells from the classes you're multi-classed with with your Warlock pack slots, as long as the slot is the right level for the spell. So those are the rules for multi-classing. Now we're going to talk about how to optimize them. First, one of the main advantages of multi-classing is we're accessing features from different classes. But just be aware that not all features are created equal. And you might want to take a look. I mean, some features that might seem like really good features when you are single-classed might not seem so great if we're accessing them at later levels. Let me give you an example. Let's say you're a bard and you're seventh level and you've just selected the polymorph spell and you realize just how great this spell is. And then you think, wouldn't it be fantastic if I could twin this spell? Problem is I need four sorcery points, but I'm a bard. It's pretty easy for me to multi-class into sorcerer. Why don't I multi-class into sorcerer, get twin spell, and then I can twin my polymorph spell? Well, what's going to happen is you're going to have to take four levels of Sorcerer, so you will be 11th level before you can twin your Polymorph spell. And what you're going to find is that Polymorph isn't quite as dramatic at 11th level as it was at 7th level. In fact, it's quite a bit less dramatic. It's still okay, but it's not as great a spell as it was at 7th. So suddenly twinning it doesn't seem all that fantastic anymore. And you've invested these four levels just to find that out. This is something you should consider beforehand. Basically, there are two things you want to look at on any feature that you're considering multi-classing to get. The first is, does it scale regardless of class levels? We actually see a lot more of this recently with the proficiency bonus per long rest kind of features because your proficiency bonus is going up regardless of your class levels. Like for example, if you multi-class into three levels of Soul Knife Rogue, you get double your proficiency bonus, number of psionic energy dice, so that is going to scale with your level even if you stick with only three levels of Soul Knife. The second thing you might want to ask yourself is, does this feature even need to scale? Because some don't. But I mean, like if you are multi-classing into Rogue, well, your sneak attack scales with level, 
And if you only take one level of rogue, well, at first level, sneak attack seems pretty good. At higher levels, one level of rogue and one die of sneak attack isn't seeming all that great anymore. It kind of does need to scale with your level in order to remain effective. However, let's say you multi-class into two levels of War Cleric. Well, now you have a channel divinity feature that gives you a plus 10 to hit. Well, that's going to still be pretty effective even at high levels as it was at low levels. One of the main things you need to consider if you're a weapon user and considering multi-classing is when are you going to access extra attack? I mean, if you are a 4th level fighter, 4th level barbarian, 4th level ranger, you are a 12th level character that does not use weapons very well. Because you're only attacking once per round and everyone else started attacking twice per round way back at level 5. So if we are multi-classing a character that is going to rely on extra attack, we probably want to get that extra attack before we start multi-classing. Now the prerequisite ability scores of multi-classing are something that you actually need to consider before deciding to multi-class. Basically a character creation. You should be thinking, do I eventually want to multi-class this character? And if so, what class do I want to multi-class into? Because otherwise, if you don't have the right ability scores, you simply won't be able to do it. That option becomes closed to you. Uh, and now what I find is, generally speaking, if you want to multi-class into something that has the same prerequisite ability scores that you do, it's dead easy, right? Uh, you know, you want to become a sorcerer who's going to be turned into a bard. That's easy peasy. You already had charisma, no problem. If there's two ability scores you need, it's a little harder, but it is totally manageable. If there are three different ability scores you're going to need, that's where it becomes a mess. This is why you don't see many Paladin Blade Singers. I mean, if you're a Blade Singer, level six, and you think two levels of Paladin would allow me to smite with these spell slots, that might sound like a great combination. However, it's the prerequisites that kill this and make it so that you just don't see it in optimized builds because you're just not going to be able to qualify. Or if you are, you're going to have to put your intelligence low enough so that the disadvantages actually outweigh any benefit you're going to get. Also, you better make sure that you meet the prerequisites of the class you're in to begin with. Otherwise, you won't be able to multi-class at all. Now, normally, that's not a problem. If you're making a wizard, you probably at least have a 13 intelligence. However, I have seen dexterity-based paladins. I've seen rangers that dump their wisdom. So it is something to at least look at if you're considering multi-classing. Now we should talk about spells a bit. And here's a little tidbit if you are considering multi-classing a spellcaster. Not all spell levels are created equally. There is one spell level that kind of stands out, and that's third level spells. Second level spells are better than first level spells, generally speaking. And fourth level spells are better than third level spells, generally speaking. But neither of those differences are nearly as much as second level spells to third level spells. Every spellcasting class in this game has standout spells at third level that are miles better than any of their spells at second level. The only spell level that is as dramatic an increase over its previous level is ninth level spells. Otherwise, if we're looking at multi-classing and we're looking at multi-classing spellcasters, going for those third level spells often is worth it. Multi-classing a spellcaster out of fourth level really hurts because although you're getting third level slots, because you don't have any third level spells, no second level spell you upcast to third level is going to be even close to what you might have gotten if you had just accessed those third level spells. Now, another thing to consider are ability score increases. Now, I don't think I need to convince any of you that ability score increases are valuable, especially if you're playing with feats, then they're even more valuable. You guys already know that. However, what I will say is a lot of you undervalue them. Why would I say that? Because I cannot count the number of times I've seen in the comments or questions on my Discord where somebody comes up to me asking me to evaluate a build idea they've come up with and they say, we're going to take seven levels in this class and three levels in this class and three levels in this other class. Uh, then we can combine these into cool class features. What do you think? Do you think this would be good? And I always have to respond, nope, I don't think it'd be good. The reason it's not good is because you've just made a 13th level character that has one ability score increase. Having a 13th level character with one ability score increase is going to be crippling. 
what happens is, of course, we're looking at the class features. Every class gets ability score increases, so we don't maybe pay as much attention to it. Instead, we're looking at that neat subclass feature we could have gotten at level 3 or at level 7, and then we kind of ignore the ability score increase at level 4. But you don't realize just how these things kind of combine once you start multi-classing, and you're just giving up those ability score bonuses. It's one thing to delay them. It's another thing not to get them at all. And then you come up with a few ideas and suddenly you've cut short your ability score increase like three times on the same build. And I think I can make a hot take here. Here's my hot take. I think that ability score increase that you didn't bother going to fourth level for is often going to be more powerful than the class feature you were excited about at level three. There are exceptions, of course. This is not uh, universal. I'm saying this as a generality. Feats are really powerful, and they are often more powerful than your class features. So those are all the basic guidelines to optimizing multiclassing. But the next thing we should talk about are the classes and the subclasses, and when exactly do you want to leave them to get the most out of them? And that's what we call a jump point. So what I'm going to be doing is I'm going to be going through every class and talking about the optimal jump points for that class. And I'll be doing that in part two of this video. So I hope you'll join me for that. Otherwise, until next time, I am going to sit back, relax, and have some fun. D&D is for everyone. Thanks, everybody. Talk to you soon.